Hello and welcome everybody to another video where I chat with Tarn Adams. This was recorded on my Twitch channel at, uh, on July 15th, around 3 p.m. Pacific we started. The whole running time was about an hour and 40 minutes for the whole thing. Uh, if you uh, are looking for a specific question, there should be timestamps in the description. If you want the unedited Twitch version with the chat replay without the questions on screen, you can find the link down in the description to that as well. If you want to see one of the previous interviews I've done with him, you can find those in the description as well. And lastly, thank you very much to everybody who supports me on Patreon, because this wouldn't be possible without them. Seriously, it wouldn't be. So thank you very much to everybody watching, and I'll see you at the end of the video. Well, we are back, and uh, a little bit early even from the announced time, and uh, I just want to say once again, welcome, Tarn, to the stream. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess we can talk about nothing for six minutes, if, that, if that's... Uh... Well, Good for people. <laughs> for, what, for whatever for whatever it's worth, I, I'm counting this as sound check. <laughs> so <laughs> when I when I mute, I then immediately see the little bars here um, that say how loud things are, so we can hear voices. Um, but uh, I mean, it's not really nothing. But uh, how was moving? I guess. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. No. That that was that was a whole a whole thing. The pandemic move. Um, yeah, it's kind of stressful. <laughs> People coming in and out of the places where I'm at and so forth. But, uh, and Zach and I are getting a little old to be carrying boxes full of books <laughs> and so forth. Uh, you know, up three flights of stairs, up and down. Um, but uh, we, we made it over. We made it over um, more or less intact. No more broken bones or anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, the new place is nice. The new place has been, has been really good so far. So, um Happy with that. I mean, I, I I suppose no matter where I was living, the heat wave would have been the same. So, yeah, don't really chalk that up to the new place so much as how things are now. I mean, the the heat wave was pretty brutal where I am, too. So, like, yeah, I think every everybody yeah. got hit by that. Um, but, uh, I mean, chat chat's very enthused to hear you, and it seems like audio balance <laughs> is all right because I, I just did some little tweaking on my end. And uh, so since we're here, I'm just going to... I'm just going to kind of start diving into questions because, I've, like I said, I've got a lot of them. Um, yeah, yeah. So the first thing I have comes in from Anonymous, and I I, I really liked this one just because it was interestingly worded, and I think it might be a fun way to start this. And it's, Coding Door Fortress is a massive undertaking, and I can barely fathom undertaking uh, such a large project. What drives you and motivates you to toss yourself at such a huge project over such a long time frame? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's been... Uh a way of life for a long time now and, and even with our early projects once you get to a certain size and we got there kind of um with the original uh drag slay game that we worked on in high school the little dragon slayer game well it wasn't little that's the point <laughs> worked on that uh, most days after school for years even into college we were still working on the same one and uh, you can just see the payoff, right? You can start seeing when the systems start working together and uh, you start having fun playing your own games, which is nice. Um, it's an extra motivator. And uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, I guess I'm gravitate toward that kind of thing too. I mean, I've always gravitated toward books that have lots of characters and long series of things and so forth that, that, that are just chunky like that. Um, so I think it's it's kind of uh, sort of a natural fit for our just my my personality as well uh, the, to work on projects that are gigantic. I suppose I mean I guess the the whole thesis thing wasn't too different from that either. Um, just just nice large projects uh, don't really. I mean you guys can probably tell I'm not much of a polisher, right? Although that is my my official job now, right? Polishing up Dwarf Fortress, but the uh, it, it, so it makes small projects kind of less satisfying in a way because we're just not we're not great at really tuning them up the way that you need to tune up a small project to stand out. Sometimes you can do really creative stuff, so there's 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 still some room, and we do play around with that kind of thing, but just not the just don't have the right kind of makeup for it. I think. Yeah, I I I definitely see what you mean when you say that you're not much of a polisher, but you know, at the same time, <laughs> like just. <laughs> I, th I think a lot of people are. A lot of people like to um, kind of focus on and polish up and finish a project. And it's it's really nice to have 
somebody who maybe is crazy enough to just continue expanding on a thing instead of just like pausing and just saying, all right, we're done here. Let's finish this. So it's, it's, I don't know. I, it's part of the reason why I think I'm attracted to the game at the very least. And I don't think I'm alone there. Yeah, no, it makes it, it, it makes sense. And it's, I mean, people, people comment on that kind of thing a lot. Like you have sort of these original innovative projects and then the people that clean them up and, and, and have, uh, you know, the, the projects that are actually marketable and do well. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe we can be both finally. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, so the next question uh, comes in from Drew, and they ask, uh, when you have writer's block or programmer's block in this case, uh, what do you do to get over it? Uh, I, I'm not, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that, that is so much. Um, although... Yeah, no, I'm still human and have have times when I'm not programming. So, um, it, but it's not something. I mean, I'm not sure if that means like just completely unable to approach a problem. I've never really felt that way. You just grab a tablet and start working on it, right? You just keep working. But um, but still, I mean, to relax and and that's important. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I'll just uh, read, play video games, that kind of thing. It's not. It's just about you know getting away from the the uh you know exact type of work that i had been doing or whatever on the on the project but um still i don't quite see it the same way i mean i don't know if that if that's it's it's the kind of thing that came out of both debugging and um math like you just keep working on the project until you wake up and understand how to solve it in the morning just it's thankless um so i don't know if i i mean that's it's i guess that's similar to writer's block and maybe that's what people mean by that i don't know but um, just this kind of thankless labor <laughs> that doesn't seem to be producing results. Um, I don't get that so much with Dwarf Fortress anymore. It feels like the design is always kind of making progress when you sit down and write and think about it. But certainly with math problems and, and sometimes with debugging, you don't feel like you're making any progress at all. And for that, it's, it's not about getting away. It's about just continuing to stoke the unconscious fires that are burning. I think that it kind of wraps back around into the, the first part of the question, you know, like the first question I asked, which was like, you know, it's the game has been so expanded over times, I guess it would almost become hard to, even if you did suffer from like, like writer's block or the inability to work on or fix a problem, there's another problem that you could go work on at the other end of it somewhere to keep your interest up at the same time. Oh, um, certainly. And that's, that's, that's in, in terms of just interest, that's, that's certainly how we've been approaching the project. I uh, just, uh, being able to work on on different different things, say like, okay, you know, here we're going to do night creatures. Here we're going to do people dancing in taverns, right? I mean, those are different things, although they can be related. <laughs> but uh, the uh, the ability to kind of switch gears like that, and knowing that it, for for some people, for a lot of people, it's still going to contribute to the game the same way because it's just part of the stories that are being being told in the fortress. People like watching their little dancing dwarves. That that actually turned out pretty well, right? You wouldn't think think that at first, maybe, but it's 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 kind of a. I, I'm not sure anyone would call it out as their favorite feature, but I see it a lot, right? People people pointing it out and 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 uh, what well, who's that? What are you doing down there? But um, yeah. So it's it's. Uh, yeah, certainly, certainly the ability to, to switch gears is something that comes from a larger project. Uh, and that's well, perhaps a, another thing that, that attracts me to it, although it's, it's uh, maybe, maybe a thing that just keeps me stuck to it. I don't know. The next question is uh, a very important, uh, mm -hmm. distressing, concerning issue that uh, many dwarves have been running into. Um, dwarves can't make their own underwear. Um, they must mm -hmm. scavenge from elves and goblins and humans um, for their clearly inferior loincloth products. And uh, it's, it's a need once they've had a taste of uh, <laughs> like elven lingerie, they, they can't get away from it. They need it. Um, when will dwarves be able to make their own underwear, if ever? Yeah, that's 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 intriguing because I, I saw someone refer to that um, in a future of the fortress before and i think i just totally didn't know what they were talking about or something and maybe missed the report on that and so i mean it's really i mean does it just come down to adding uh the the loincloths and or thongs to the entity file and 
or is there also a problem with them not dressing up even if you do that? I, um, I, I, mean, I haven't attempted changing the Raws, but what I do know happens, or as, as I understand it, um, if like you fight a army of elves and ha like most of them have loincloths on, the dwarves will put on the loincloths, and I don't think that they replace clothing unless there is an article of clothing of that type for them to replace it with, um, if yeah, I understand yeah. that correctly. So eventually the, the, the underwear will just rot off their body, and then they get a massive mood hit when that happens. And it's like a scarring moment in their lives and they never forget it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's part of the symbiosis of elf and dwarf, but that is not intentional. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, the, 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 the code for like determining, like they have this mental picture of the clothing they want to wear and it has all the different layers and layering thoughts and they have to think about how thick things are and just all this stuff. But they care about the categories. There's like underlayer, overlayer, and stuff like that. And they care about all of the representatives. But yeah, no, it'd be a kind of glaring problem. Um, it is apparently a glaring problem that they just don't have something in that category. But it is, it's something that can fill them. Now, I don't understand why they're able to wear. Um, you're saying they wear elven loincloths when they're dropped or something? Yep. I mean, is that like, aren't those narrow? Don't those count as narrow? I, I don't know, but I've definitely seen yeah. them wearing them before. Um, yeah, it seems like I mean they can can they can they wear all elven clothes because I thought they were in different size categories, but uh, maybe that's not true anymore. I don't know. I, Did I get rid of narrow and it just doesn't happen anymore? Is it all based on size? Yeah, this is all. This is one of the downsides of working on a large project. <laughs> it's, there's this like I remember narrow was definitely a thing like at some point. I don't know if it's true anymore. I'm just completely detached from whether that's reality, but it seems like a simple thing to fix, and it seems like a big problem. I mean, but yeah, as big problems go, it's not the raid crash or anything, right? Yeah, it's just so. a very funny one. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> so now, now I have um, a bunch of questions about UI and stuff lined up. So that that kind right. of stuff's coming next. Um, so the the first question is, um, what were some objectives that you had in mind when working on the uh, Steam user interface? Like, uh, what were some things you wanted to specifically try and streamline? Like, what what were your goals? Oh, I don't know that we that we. I mean, we're not we're not experts in the field. So if we sit down and sort of theorize about that kind of thing, we just end up sounding stupid. I think, but uh, at the same time, we've heard enough complaints over the years that we really just kind of went through that. Um, just like what what kind of things are really irritating for people obviously how the key bindings work and stuff like that. And then we've played a bunch of games, obviously. So once you throw the mouse into the mix, um, it becomes a lot easier to think about how, how you might use that to draw all over the place or whatever and click things and so forth. But and then, you know, we just sat back and had a bunch of discussions about information and, um, you know, how many clicks and how many key presses it took to do a given thing. Uh, we had stuff like the 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 being able to place all those rooms at once, for instance, right? Just kind of came out of like discussions with Zach and I, and then I think Klinadev showed up and 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 mentioned something along those lines. It's just kind of this big sort of d discussion um, that that sort of co cobbling cobbling this thing together. I'm not I'm not sure there's a there's a unifying uh, philosophy. <laughs> behind it other than just making things easier for people when we can. Um, and, uh, I mean, it seems to be going that way. Uh, it was just so, so much stuff is easier than, I mean, we're used to using a 10 key to move cursors around because of how we used to draw these little animations of little people hitting each other in basic and like the block in, in, in code page 437 is a 219. So pressing alt and then 219 puts a block on the screen and we're used to just typing you know, 178s and 219s and 196s and 195s know a lot of the codes and really fast with the 10 key. And so it, it's similar finger motions have us drawing stockpiles and that kind of thing. And you just kind of become oblivious to uh, the pain a little bit. And uh, so we just kind of took ourselves out of that mindset and, and, you know, working for people like assume you have no number pad at all and, can't use one. Um, you know what? What would be? What would this game look like? What would this game look like if it was just like another paradox game or something like that? Yeah. 
and that's kind of where we're where we've been coming from. So it's not it's not a it, it wasn't like a big sort of interface cathedral we're building or something where we thought about it in advance as much as we could have, I suppose. But we, there's just not much point, I think, um, given that we don't have the uh, sort of training and experience there. Yeah, and also like this morning, uh, Steam announced a new console thing. I saw like that. A handheld saw computer, that. and I'm looking at that going like, I wonder, man, I want to get one of those just to try playing Dwarf Fortress on it, <laughs> but... Like, yeah, is that, I don't know how that works because it's it's Linux based, but it's there's something called Proton or something and all yeah. this other. Stuff. I don't know anything about it about how they get like just regular Windows games on there. Would they be the Linux version or something like that? Like how would that work? I have no is idea. It, is is Steam OS Linux? I I don't know. Right, it's one of those things. Or is it a flavor of Linux? Steam and you have OS to support it is specifically based on Arch Linux, according to their. Q and A thing. Isn't that one of the ones where we have a lot of problems with? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I'm not a Linux person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see what happens. But yeah, who knows if is is I mean is Proton Wine or whatever. I don't know any of that. But it's intriguing. Or it people seem intrigued by it anyway. Yes. yes. I mean, who doesn't want Door Fortress in their backpack? Because we all know that no one's pockets will fit that thing. <laughs> 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 it looked pretty big. So the, the next question is pretty general, but um, the, the question is, is there any work being done towards easier dwarf management? Not simpler or dumbed down, just a better user interface for user experience managing, like tools such as search functions and the ability to select best candidates for a job or military based on psychology and attributes. Um, and any visualizing of that data, similar to things that dwarf, dwarf therapist currently does, but also eliminating eliminating the need for dwarf therapist as well. So we've we've started in on some of this stuff now. You probably saw the information hub with the the unit list. Um, easy to find your most stressed out dwarves now. That kind of thing, and it's just starting. So so there's going to be. We haven't done the military yet at all. Um, haven't done um, administrator assignment where the where you start getting into like skills as well um, and are still kind of fiddling through auto labor stuff like I because I've, I've just been working on work orders I, I did the need did the, did the news go up today yes it did uh, okay good uh, so so the um, yeah so that's that's kind of we're not quite at the sort of dwarf interface of labor and work orders I'm still just I mean work orders are going to take a little bit longer because I have to do those conditions and stuff um, but it's uh, it's going well I just did filtering filtering my work orders but um, yeah so I think I think like we're still trying to stay away from a giant dwarf therapist grid um, there's like I still don't want it to be a spreadsheet game uh, spreadsheet games ultimately frustrate people and uh don't and take you out of the kind of I don't know I don't like them <laughs> but uh, you know are there things where you're going to need that much information I'm not I'm not sure um, that the labor will really work that way we're kind of leaning more toward and this is already in this is actually I mean you can see the tabs on the news but it was uh, the workshop profiles are a bit simplified now not because we're dumbing down the game or whatever it just doesn't make sense to have like the skill settings where you can set it between like skill three and seven. It just doesn't feel like it fits where we, where we wanted to go with guilds and apprentices and that kind of thing. So now you can assign masters to shops and that can control kind of, it's sort of, sort of a um, sort of proxy VPL thing that fits into more of the kind of guild stuff we're hoping to do. Uh, I don't think we're going to do a lot with guilds before the, um, Steam release because that would be you know we're not going to do unnecessary sidetracks as much as we usually do <laughs> because this thing has to get done it's been a long time but I feel like yeah that that we're sort of going to be approaching this this auto labor type of or labor considerations from a lot of different directions at once and are going to have to sort of feel it out because at the same time the military equipment rewrite. Thing is going to have to happen to get rid of the raid crash. I need to get the whole system. We're just at that point. It's kind of the nuclear option for getting rid of the corruption there. Um, but that all has to change when we redo the the military screen, and then that interfaces with picks, axes, um, crossbows for hunting, 
that are some of the other kind of annoying uh, things to deal with when you do the labor rewrite. So it it's it's all going to have to come together, and then we'll see kind of where that lands. Um, like, I think we're, we're probably going to fish around a bit more for like what people's use cases are for um, things like, like, like dwarf therapy, like what, what, what really is important about labor settings that, that you think would, you know, make, I mean, cause I know people will come up with like these profession assignments that have like a collection of labor settings and, and so forth. Um, it'd be like some, make some kind of what hybrid guild or hybrid labor core thing. So I'm trying to think of how it's, how it'd be contextualized, like in the story of the fort, you know, um, that, that could have that stuff arise in a natural way, or if that is really necessary. Um, yeah. So we're still kind of plotting through that, I think. So the next question, uh, is, pretty short and to the point, I think. Um, how much of the UI that we see in screenshots is still placeholder, approximately? Uh, what is placeholder in this context? Does it mean non-functioning or does it mean crappy? Does it mean crappy graphics are not working buttons? Maybe a combination kind of, of the two, I think? Yeah, or I guess I could just answer for both because it's not difficult to answer for both. Uh, pretty much everything you see works. Um, there are a few exceptions, uh, and I kind of called them out when I mentioned them. Like in the in the info hub, I was like, "No, most of those tabs don't work yet, right?" In fact, the tabs have changed quite a bit. Like, there's no manager tab anymore because work orders have kind of come out in their own thing, so we could interface them into the buildings easily. Um, when you have building work orders versus general work orders, now there's just kind of this little work order pop up thing you do, um, which um, yeah. So it's it's. Uh, uh, that that part. I mean, so there's there's placeholders like that that don't come up that often. Uh, some of the unit tab tabs need to be like when you click on the unit has uh, the units. When you click on the dwarf, it pops up a sheet. The sheet has a bunch of information on it, but there's also like a zillion tabs, and a lot of those tabs aren't done. Uh, they're just going to be like information in lists, so it's not doesn't feel like a you know big big project. But there's going to be there's going to be stuff to do there. Um, now, on the other hand, when you're like, oh, uh, that O button in the lower right of the latest screenshots, which is our work order kind of button, that's an O I drew in paint. Um, <laughs> there are placeholders like that in quite a few places in the new, like like the, a lot of the buttons and so forth. It's because when I work on a screen, I just try and get it together and haven't sort of set up and and I don't want to have the artist draw a bunch of stuff that we're not going to use. So we kind of wait for stuff to shake out, finalize a little bit more. And then we can say like, okay, do a pass on these buttons. And uh, then those will look a lot nicer. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't know if the, there were other like specific objections to some, some, some things that we posted, but there are quite a few kind of placeholder buttons. The art though, like the art stuff is, is like for creatures and all that kind of thing. That's pretty much, how it's going to be, uh, unless you see the debug creature, of course. We are big fans of the debug creature around here. <laughs> we, still, we, still, we still want the debug creature to get to the... I mean, it's just, it was too good. It was too good. How can it be a debug creature when it has to be an actual creature now? It was good enough. Or something. I got my artist something. to animate him to dance, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> the, the next question here is about cavalry. Um, mm. and, uh, the, the question goes something like this, which is, it's not particularly clear and artists are saying different things. So will there be separate modular sprites for cavalry, um, uh, where you see a rider and the thing that they're riding, or will it be like the old days where the sprite flickers between the rider and the thing that it is riding? So our, uh, current, dis and there's a, there's a lot, there's, um, we have a we have a little place where we talk about things, and there are many different threads. Uh, and we didn't talk we haven't talked about this for a while, but I believe our last kind of um, discussion about this was that okay, we've got these creatures now: um, the humans, dwarves, elves, kobolds, and um, goblins that can be chopped up into little pieces, and that means that you could totally just chop off chop off one of the legs and print it behind or whatever, and 
throw them, um, you know, some pixels higher. We have the layering thing that builds them. There could just be a horse layer, right? That just slaps a horse <laughs> right in there, and it would just work on the on the sprites. Everything fits in a three by two, right? That's our that's kind of our 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 fit for um, for these things. Now, I don't know if our if our horse pictures and so forth are um, compatible with like the size if they need to be redrawn because a lot of the a lot of the mount type creatures are smaller than they would be in comparison to uh, uh, the like a like a human because you want the to save the three by two for things like dragons and giant elephants and stuff like that 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 really need the the space to distinguish themselves so it kind of is yet to be seen whether or not like the human riding the current horse sprite just looks kind of stupid um, or whether or not we'd need like a new horse sprite or something but a new horse sprite's not like out of the question um, or even just a partial larger horse sprite might look better, like a chess piece or something. Um, but but it's definitely something we've we've discussed doing, and um, just just doesn't seem like it takes a whole lot of really creative coding or like lots of extra artwork to get the basic mounts that are important to look that way but then you kind of get into trouble of like well what about elf mounts or something right like how do you draw like winged creatures with elves riding them um you know and can we guarantee you know that those 200 creatures or whatever are going to be all kind of saddled up and look proper with every elf sitting on them i don't think we're ready to say that at all that's that's a lot of extra work it's you know, once we're in a stable position to continue working on this stuff uh, without like worrying about release dates and that kind of thing, that you know we'd certainly love to kind of do that kind of stuff just to make it look nicer. But um, but that's kind of, that's that's kind of where we're where we're where we're at. I mean, I I would definitely not be surprised to see the kind of main mount creatures be respected and then the others kind of work in the old way or some similar way. I mean, from my point of view personally, I would be totally fine with either. I don't think that it w I would care all that much about things flickering back and forth. That being said, I think that's one of those things that might be confusing to the untrained eye <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That's one of those things where it's like, I see people ask about that every now and again. It's kind of goes along hand in hand with the smooth movement question of like, yeah, we'll, we'll move, dwarves move <laughs> smoothly, and I think we talked about that once before, so I'm not going to bother you that about that one again. But it's like it, it kind of just is what it is to a point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, we're not. Yeah, we're not. We're not a super high budget game, but uh, we can we can keep working on this stuff. Um, but if, at least for the mount question, unlike the smooth movement question, with the mount question, it's really not. It's, it's not a question of like engine limitations or anything like that. Yeah. So that's much easier to do. So the next question is: uh, In the Steam edition, will creatures be visible on lower Z levels as they don't seem to be currently? Oh yeah, I'm, there, that, there's the whole. The buildings aren't either. There's like a lot of stuff where it was just like, I think when I when I finally got that working. I was just like, oh, look, there's the, you know, look, look, it's cool. I, you know, and then I just tagged like, oh, yeah, print the other layer, print the other kind of creature building item, et cetera. Yeah, just flat, pull, push them through later because um, it's really not, it's, it doesn't make, it's not, it's not going to make it any slower. It's not going to be hard to do or anything. I, I just haven't done it yet. <laughs> no, they're definitely going to be there. You're definitely going to see things like you'll be able to watch an animal like walk downhill and stuff. So the next question is about water. Um, and mm -hmm. this person is concerned about flow numbers. Are we going to get flow numbers on liquids in the Steam version? Uh, so that that's something that I think we have graphics for that. I think we already have that. Um, but uh, yeah, we just wanted to make a version that didn't have them um, just for kind of visual purposes, really. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think we'll we'll definitely have a flip flip back and forth. Lots of little graphics options. We haven't really been in the position to think about this kind of thing before. And now we're like, well, you know, you can, what is it when you, when you click the settings button, there's always like gameplay, video, audio, and then there's um, like graphics or whatever, like or it's under the video section, but sometimes there's a separate, a separate section. 
where you decide like what are all the little cool blood splatters what are all the cool little things i'd like right and that that sounds like we just need that kind of thing now and a lot of the stuff from like the init files like we really can't rely on text init files anymore for for the steam version because that's that's just way too deep in the guts of the game for stuff that should just be in a window right um, like a regular game. Uh, that's how, so you're seeing our, here's our interface thinking, <laughs> our, our deep interface thinking yet again. It's like, what would a regular game do <laughs> that we haven't done to this point? And, um, you know, how can we just do that sort of thing? And, and generally that's good enough. Um, so, so I, 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 yeah, I'd expect it just to be a little clickable option in some, some graphics tab. Yeah, I mean, I, I on the topic of the, the graphics options that you now need to think about. Uh, one thing I see again and again and again, especially um, in relation to the news posts, is like, man, the the, the, the blue text is still unreadable. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, and, and especially for that, yeah, for that post, I was actually like, I should finally just tackle this because I saw it there. And I'm like, I can't read this. <laughs> so, especially because the, um, the, it's even worse. It was already bad, right? Dark blue was the worst. It's already bad. Um, but now that we have kind of now we're in VGA or super VGA or true color, whatever it's called, I don't remember for 24 bits, we're in we're in 24 bit land. So we're like, oh, we can have these really nice looking windows that aren't black anymore. They're like color or something, you know, like they have like 32s and 30s and different things inside the the RGB values that are like subtly um, non non black, but also like lighter than dark gray. What's my eyedropper say? 49. 49, 49, 49. And 49 uh, for RGB values is like a very dark gray. But when you mix that with the dark blue, then you're really asking for a lot of trouble uh, once you've done that to yourself. So, yeah, we're just going to have to change either just change the values of, of our default 16 colors or I mean, you can see it actually when you when you look at the um, tabs, you see that one of the uh, the the tabs that aren't selected are a the text that's inside of tabs that aren't selected is a color. It's a color that is a nice deep brown. Uh, the brown selected is uh, looks like seventy one forty five one here uh, in RGB, although I'm not sure everything survived the various transitions from computers and things. But uh, so it's a nice brown that doesn't actually exist in our in our 16 color model uh, because I've got the ability to print text in any color. And so we're just like, oh, let's just make the tabs look nice. Um, and so that's that's now a whole thing. Like, do we go through the different pieces of the game and say, well, let's just pick new canonical values for texts that are all over the spectrum and get away from the 16 color text. Uh, one of the reasons not to do that is just because there's so much text and so many calls that set the color in the 16 color model that it would just be a, just a, a lot of work. And uh, but there are cases where, like, especially the, the blue lists, where, like, we do have to make a decision. We either go into our 16 colors in the current files, because you can do this right now, right? If you're, if you're bothered by dark blue in the, in the old version that you can download, like the existing version of DF, you can just go into the color file um, that's, that's in the, um, uh, where is it, data init, data init colors.txt. And right now, dark dark blue is zero zero one twenty eight, and you can just you know make that one ninety two or whatever you want, right? Um, and throw in some other values for the R and the G, like thirty two or something, to make it look nicer. And that, there you go. So we could end up doing that. It's probably the easier solution, but um, we could also start experimenting with like, well, what if a Fisher dwarf isn't that color, but a Fisher dwarf is a very Fisher dwarfy color? I don't know. I don't know. Is that starting to get to sacrilege? Are we getting to sacrilege yet? I mean, I made vomit blue in my games, so if you want to talk about sacrilege. <laughs> that's like troll vomit. Yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> I don't know. I imagine that plump helmets are kind of a bluish color, but 
sue me. Um, also, to be clear, <laughs> this is an adult-rated channel, so you're allowed to swear. You don't need to worry about not saying shitload or anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, no, you just uh, talked about it loose in the floodgates, you know. Yep. Um, yeah. It's all good. Um, that shit, shit coming through the floodgates. Although not in Dwarf Fortress, because we don't, we don't yet have flowing shit, do we? I actually have a question about that later. It's um, probably an important question. It's a very important question. Um, <laughs> but uh, ne- next year we have, uh, we got two more about the the Steam release version. Then we get to move on to other things. But uh, <laughs> uh, there's been very little talk about mm. uh, classic Dwarf mm. Fortress in relation to the Steam launch. Yes. And uh, this person says, so as far as uh, I understand, all major UI changes will be carried over to Classic as well. If this is the case, when can we expect to start seeing uh, some of these various changes in Classic and what will it look like? Um, if this is yeah, not the case, so... then how will they bleed <laughs> over? No, no, we're going to try and get everything over there. Um, it's, it's understandably not the top priority project right now. Because we need to, I mean, it's all about like deadlines and minimal viable products and making sure that you have fallback positions, right? It's like if something goes horribly wrong and I'm in the hospital for three months and then we have to release into early access and then, you know, what we want to release is going to be what we're, what we've been working on, right? Um, It's like uh, doing, doing, you know, classic can be released you know, a little bit later if we get into some emergency position and uh, things, a lot, of, a lot of things like that, right? Stuff that can like, like arena mode or something. Arena mode's not going to take a long time, but if arena mode came, you know, a little bit later, that's fine too. It's like, I mean, we're still here. We're still going to be working after the Steam launch. So it's not like life or death to do that. Now that said, of course, the plan is to release with these things. And uh, and not go to the hospital for three months, right? It's like that's a good plan. I like that plan. I'm going to stick with that one. Um, so, yeah. So we don't have anything to show on classic because we haven't been doing classic, right? Um, but the the not the the idea the the code is set up so that it's just going to work. Like you'll have all the mouse commands, you'll have all the menus, and all of that stuff. Um, because and the reason we know that is because. All of the menus that you see in Dwarf Fortress right now, if you take out a ruler on the screenshots, they're all done in uh, 8x12 um, grid. They're all just done in an ASCII grid. That's no different. Um, and they could just be all, all we have to do. Basically, what doing classic is, is choosing like what what are the glyphs that we replace the, the, the boundary, the borders with and the buttons. Like we have a nice kind of 3x, uh, no, it'd be 4x3 button of a stockpile link, right? And do we want to do if we if we want to do kind of the lowest impact change over to classic mode would be to change that into like a a four by three button that just says SL or something on the inside of it, and you click it for stockpile links. And we still have all the same hover and stuff, so it's not super confusing or anything. Now, does that start to look a little weird? Does it start to be a little like this is a an ASCII game sort of masquerading as a modern game. It starts to look very strange. That's going to be a kind of, yeah, we'll have to do a kind of field check as we're going through that and then sort of, you know, deviate more um, from the existing kind of uh, uh, modern modern layouts. But fortunately, all the buttons have just little positions that can be changed. It's pretty easy to say like, oh, well, in this case, this button is this shape. This case, this button is this shape. And it's just called like create stockpile link in text rather than a box. There'll be a few times where the fits are a little tight, but it's not so bad. There's a lot of room to play with mostly. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're I don't know, pretty confident that's going to it's going to look nice. Um, all of those like unit sheets that you see laid out just all the rectangles can be the same because code page 437 provides us with so many lines, so many double lines, so many half double lines. It's like that's half of the code page, right? It's just like, here are some borders for you to draw with. And um, so I think, yeah, and, and then the text that, that's in those windows, it all just kind of goes through. It's all, it's all I mean, I'm not going to have to change anything. It's the exact same code. Uh, so I think um, it's, it's kind of... Um, then there's the question of like the underlying part where where the so that's the overlying interface right and so getting used to that um, and how that works and then there's the underlying part is the kind of 
32 by 32 currently, those those graphical kind of things compared to the old version, uh, or rather, yeah, the, the existing version that's released. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's always a little fumble because I'm, I'm not supposed to call the existing release classic, right? Because that confuses people. There's the existing release or old Dwarf Fortress or whatever, and then there's the classic one, which is actually the new one without the graphics. <laughs> so that that how that's going to work with the 32 by 32 thing of course it's just going to be ascii like it always has been and then it kind of but it, it's kind of living on this viewport that's underneath the the interface layer but if you since it'll all be lined up you won't be able to tell that that's how it's done unless you're digging around unless something really creepy happens and it starts to move <laughs> Be like eating a mushroom and net hack or something. It's like the 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 layer underneath starts to slide a few pixels, um, and and offsets itself from the interface or something. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But uh, yeah, I mean I'm not sure if I've wandered around or if I'm answering the question at this point. But um, that's uh, that's that's the idea is to kind of just sort of configure it. It's like it's like configuring it kind of like configuring classic. Once we have the uh, the regular Steam release in place, it's actually it's it's kind of interesting to hear that back and forth because like uh, especially like the confusion between calling the current release class or not calling the current release classic and just it's just existing Door Fortress and then future free release <laughs> would be classic because yeah, the, the future this, classics <laughs> th this has to be how every single person who. Uh, like works in games press or games media must feel whatever new console <laughs> comes out. It's like, oh, next generation console. Wait, that's the one that we're all using now. Previous generation yeah. console. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like modernism and postmodernism and post postmodernism. And... But modern is, as a as a casual word is just like the times you're in now, even though it's also the times before. Current days. They became they became post. Yes. Um. <laughs> The, the 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 last question I have about the Steam version is: uh, Will the music change with the release of the Steam version? And if so, please add like add an option to make the original track playable. Thanks. <laughs> so yeah, no, there's 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 new music. It's part of the part of the deal. Um, that's still ongoing. It's actually gotten more interesting now, but I don't have any details because Tanya is still working out a lot of stuff. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but the original guitar track. Um, can't really easily it, to to just for like the the average you know person we want to have play the game now, like mixing in the regular guitar track is like a really bad idea because it's so scratchy, right? The recording is so amateurish that I did like seventeen, eighteen years ago. Just um, I don't know, it was two thousand four. Is that when it was recorded? Was that seven, seventeen years ago? Anyway, um, it's just just. I, I played it into my laptop, right, or whatever. I didn't, like, have a studio. And so it, it just is glaring when you play it next to other tracks. It just, like, the noise just goes, or whatever. It's not great. So uh, the the current idea is to keep it in the game and, and, for instance, just play it during Legends mode, something like that. And, and then now for people who want to mess around with the music, um, kind of the, the tentative idea was just to have, like, a playlist or whatever. And so you could just move the tracks around or put in your own tracks or something like that. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work, especially as it regards like outside tracks or whatever, but um, that you'd be able to mess around with that stuff a little bit. So, I mean, if you want to, if you want to just kind of keep mainlining the four minute loop or whatever, you know, like a, like a good door fortress player, then, um, then that's, uh, that's fine with me. I just I know that there's a lot of people that are very very attached to those sounds. Like I know for <laughs> myself at this point, it's like almost as memorable as like the Mario theme song. It's just like I think Dwarf Fortress and that little riff pops into my brain. But <laughs> so now I have a, a small handful of questions about adventure mode. Um, yeah, and the the first one. Adventure mode. The first one comes in from my my artist Cooler, and he says, uh, "Will ranged weapons ever get more detailed? Currently, in adventure mode, ranged weapons, when fired, load and fire one of the ammunition types from your inventory. There is no ability to choose ammunition or preload it. Uh, will there be an ability to select ammo type as well as <laughs> preload ammunition 
for a weapon. Uh, as right now, firing the weapon takes way too much time, making ranged weapons non-viable in a lot of encounters in adventure mode. Yeah, so as, as people noted variously, I mean, we have the whole combat arc thing we never got to, right? And um, it's still something we're hoping to do, obviously, like many things. And ranged weapons is one of those things that just didn't get any attention at all. Uh, and that's, I mean, the thing, the, the little notes we've just kind of taken for yourselves are exactly that, just like preloading. I mean, you've seen how, how f- like, sort of down to the, 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 the microsecond detail the, 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 the melee attacks are now, right? It's like you, you have, like, incoming attacks that can be, can, can be intercepted and so forth that happen over, like, three frames or whatever, and I'd expect the ranged weapons to get the treatment when we get there. Like, like is the, what ammo item has been selected? What is, you know, what is its current status on the weapon? Is the weapon kind of raised to fire? Are you aiming uh, extra? You know, are you, are you doing some kind of, I mean, I haven't, I don't know much about, well, I did, I did shoot like a, what was it? They have these weird ratings for them. It's like poundages and stuff, but they're also just like, this is a woodchuck rated bow or something, right? So I've shot, I've shot a, I did not shoot it at a woodchuck, but I have shot a woodchuck rated bow. <laughs> That's the limit of my experience as a child firing arrows and remembering having to wear that wrist guard and then getting the string caught up behind that and that kind of thing. No fun. But, uh, so that, so I'd expect, I'd expect there to be some, some detail in uh, you know what kind of shot you're taking and 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 that kind of thing um, you know to the point where it, it's more like the 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 short range stuff. So the 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 next question I've got here um, is something that I actually ran into the last time I played Adventure Mode, which is uh, since I killed a night troll uh, in Adventure Mode, uh, I am being hailed <laughs> by both uh, as both a hero and a murderer by the local people in Adventure <laughs> Mode. So I got to ask, uh, will there ever be changes made to the reputation system? Are they calling you a murderer or a killer? A hero and a murderer. Uh, that's the wording they're using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's, I mean, so there's, there's this weird distinction um, that comes out of, you know, yeah, it comes out of... Uh, being in a family where there was, you know, my father was a Vietnam vet. Um, so we kind of took that kind of thing seriously. Uh, it's just a distinction that, that you'd kill people. It doesn't actually have value judgment in the game. Uh, the same way as it is murdering their friends. Now, I'm not saying that that's not something they've experienced. And I mean, like if the, if the word was like, you're, you know, you're a murderer or whatever, then that would probably relate to the historical figure being one of their previous relatives or something like that. And that's, that's something that should just be kind of fixed. If it's a bug, if it's a killer thing, it's more a wording issue. Cause I mean, the, 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 um, they're more just sort of acknowledging that you're dangerous and that, that, that generally you're generally a dangerous person, not to them necessarily. Uh, but you've kind of crossed over into a, a different sort of person. Um, but, but, uh, it, yeah, it could definitely use some, some wording changes. It's like having the skull over your head in RuneScape, meaning that you killed a player recently. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 was, yeah that's, that sounds similar. <laughs> so the, the next person, the next question is kind of a, a wordy one. So bear with me. Um, they say, uh, hi Tarn. Uh, I was thinking about adventure mode right. becoming my favorite mode. Uh, and I was s- uh, specifically impressed with being able to play in an active world where every action is consequential and every event and person has a reason to be there. But I find that if in the future of adventure mode it is still going to be it that yeah, hold on. But I find that if in the future adventure mode uh, is still being treated as a secondary afterthought to fortress mode, uh, and they think that this would be odd. Um, with mention myths and magic, uh, they see adventure mode becoming more popular. Uh, for pure fans as it would become the de facto open world game. Um, to put it simply, do you think that there will be a, uh, a, ga- a gap closed between Fortress and Adventure Mode modes uh, so that Fortress Mode uh, should still be the main mode, but more players can experience Adventure Mode? It was actually the intent of the villain release, as, as, as uh, we talked about a bit. 
Uh, and then we delayed the villain release <laughs> because the Steam stuff came up. Uh, but it was it was going to be kind of we're trying to give uh, some potential structure to adventure mode without. I mean, it can't be a traditional RPG, right? Um, like the, it's not going to have some kind of overarching story and leveling and uh, loot grinding and all the kind of stuff that that you can traditionally lean on when you create an RPG it just doesn't work um, in our setup. So we need to do something else, and that something else was going to be trying to do these sort of um, plot investigations or being able to be a villain yourself, just sort of looping you more into the world, more in, more more intrigue, more social relationships. We had those kind of five new new uh, properties for the relationships that we didn't get to flush out. The whole uh, I'm going to miss at least one because I always do when I try and list things, but the whole um, love, respect, fear. Uh, trust and loyalty, yes, those five, um, as kind of new ways to contextualize player relationships within these networks. And I mean, on top of the rep system and the kind of personality and value system uh, and just see what we could do with that, mess around with that for some months uh, as you're kind of doing these, uh, these kind of investigations or running your own little schemes on people. Um, and then we didn't do any of that. Um, which is still uh, kind of, as we said, after the Steam release, we clean up the Steam release, and then we get back to the villains and the army uh, stuff before the Myth and Magic thing. Now, Myth and Magic has a whole list of paper about adventure mode stuff um, and what that can be. Uh, and, of course, that can, be, that, can, that, can, that can be really interesting as well. Uh, so I think, um, I think that, that you know, hopefully we'll see adventure mode come into its own sometime. Hasn't seemed to work out yet, although more and more people kind of enjoy messing around with it. Uh, but that's really kind of mostly been the limit of it. Um, so yeah, no, we're hoping to hoping to have more there. The army, the army part also has uh, kind of a lot of cutouts for adventure mode. Um, being able to kind of get involved with the larger groups of armies that will be moving around and things. Um, being able to kind of join up in this whole sort of noble or administrator network and not like we can't do all of the responsibilities there because a lot of them aren't even implemented for the npcs like the what are they like building inspectors and road road maintainers and stuff or whatever was it was it julius caesar was a road inspector before they were emperor i don't recall it's something like that but the the uh there's there's this whole thing but 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 at least when it comes to like leading armies and stuff we were hoping to I mean, that, not, more than hoping that was in the list for the Army Arc stuff is getting that into Adventure Mode. No, we're always thinking about it. It's because, I mean, it comes out of the fact that Dragslay was just Adventure Mode, right? I mean, it's, you know, so we know, we know it can be done. We know we can make a better game. And hopefully we will actually do it. <laughs> I mean, from, from my current standpoint, I, I'm still sitting here going, I think that Legends Mode is actually my favorite way to play. It's just, I, I know that if I <laughs> only streamed Legends from here on out forever, I don't think anybody would watch me for very long, <laughs> but you know. Yeah, we are. well, are you looking forward to Hyperlinks then? Uh, very much so. I'm very much looking forward to anything related to Legends Mode features, because everybody's, you know, all excited about Fortress Mode and Adventure Mode, and I'm just sitting here going like, I just want Legends to be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no yeah no it's it's not it's it, obviously we're not going to do super a lot of work before the steam thing because it's kind of a sort of the it is an appendage in a way but um it's an important appendage because you really can see how much crap is in your world um and i and, and the hyperlinks will really help people kind of investigate their forts and then the people that came to their forts the people they've met the important the important historical figures and stuff um yeah, I'm not sure we're going to get to any of the tools and things that, that are in the utilities, as far as I can tell. Um, but eh, it's a process. So uh, the, the, next, uh, the next area of my questions that I have here is outlined as myths, sieges, other stuff, future, and everything else that didn't fit <laughs> previously. Um, so <laughs> this is a bit of a mishmash of everything here. Um, so the first question I have here is about sieges. And they say, in my opinion... Uh, sieges mm -hmm. are currently a bit of a mixed bag, since all you have to do is build a drawbridge, pull it up, and when uh, the times are, are and when the end times are upon you, all you do is you just 
you make like that and you have to defend uh, from a siege and wait until they walk away. Uh, are there any plans uh, on adding more depth to sieges? Someone needs to look at the roadmap. Uh, for example, <laughs> ladders or battering rams and so on and so forth to the sieges. Uh, and, and I've heard some rumors about allowing NPCs to dig under a fortress, but other than that, I've heard nothing. Good luck on your future <laughs> endeavors. Yeah, yeah, but that's the thing. Is like, I mean, the roadmap doesn't have that much more detail, right? It's like, it's like, because... It seems like the kind of thing that's just fun to do it and tell people half of what's going on and then let, I mean, it, it is, it's not often anymore that we get to just unleash crap on people, right? Yeah. And this is like the place to do it. <laughs> like, I mean, what if we did, did things like battering rams and then didn't tell you about it? I mean, wouldn't that be cool for once? But um, I mean, Adventure Mode was actually released like that, which is pretty funny. Uh, the original adventure mode. We just kept it a secret and released it. But um, yeah, at the same time, people like devlogs and people like talking about stuff in advance. So obviously we'll be talking about the sieges while we work on them. But yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if the, the occasional thing is, is kept, uh, kept in the dark. Um, but yeah, certainly, I mean, mixed bag, I think, is too kind to the current sieges. Um, I mean, they really are just you can just not do them if you don't want to. And it's just a mass of flesh, right? It's like the, yeah, it's kind of like a zombie game or something. Just a, just a, just a slime <laughs> that comes and flows into your fortress, but it's not, yeah, it doesn't think. It doesn't think at all. It'd be good to, it's difficult. It's a difficult prospect, especially because the geometry can be anything, right? But, um, yeah, and then do you just it, let them go in the same direction that they do currently and then just, like, channel one down and dig underneath whatever you have or deconstruct your walls or... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's... it's, it's uh, I'd like it to not seem omniscient anymore because it, it's funny because they, they are, like, a thoughtless slime, but they also have, like, complete knowledge of where to go, right? Mm -hmm. And... Which is, you know, good for what it's worth because they need to go in there and kill people. But I'd like them to, like, have, I mean, it'd be nice and not, and it's not super difficult in some sense. And then it starts to get harder and harder of, of having just like a mental map of danger zones, places they've explored. And this is already, you know, in a small sense in part of the game. We do have like some exploration tracking and other stuff, not in sieges, but in, uh, in the context of, I think the demons, um, people like to call them whatever. This is an adult-rated channel, so we don't call them clowns. But yeah. um, the 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 when you when you do the end game content or whatever, the um, uh, they have a lot of tracking for exploring the fort to make sure that they get up in there uh, if they can. Um, not that they do a great job if you make a wooden block wall and block a passageway or whatever stupid thing, right? It's just it's kind of ridiculous. Um, they should just be able to burn those down or whatever, but. Uh, so I think I think there's a lot of room there to make it feel like you're being probed, your defenses are being probed, and then that then when they throw an attack at you, that it actually feels like you know a tactic is being employed, like they're doing this and they're not putting everything into it if it's not if it's not a great idea, um, and then they can bring in the beasts or something like. Then you see that they have a troll legion or something. And and then and, and so it kind of just all the stuff that makes it feel more like it's a, a big epic story or whatever, right? Um, I think is I think is appropriate. I have a question. Context. What if goblins were projectiles, and well, uh, trolls could throw them? Yeah. So that I mean, so so t like technically, all of the pieces of that are in the game. <laughs> I think the I don't think the uh, they use the straight line code though, right? They don't use the par parabola code that we have for mine carts. They use just like the fly like an arrow code. Although I don't recollect, like if a person flies out of a mine cart, do they fly straight or do, do they get a parabola flag then? Uh, I don't remember. I, I mean, just don't remember. other objects fly straight, so I would assume they would fly straight. Yeah, because all you need to do is, like, we have a flag on the projectile that just says, like, use physics, and then they fly in parabola shapes instead. And I don't remember how it's applied. I know it applies to minecarts when you jump them and stuff, because that was the point. But 
the uh, I don't remember how it applies to things that you like shotgun out of mine cards when you crash them and stuff, or if everything flies straight. But in any case, yes, then they'd have to pitch if they wanted to throw a goblin into your fortress, like over a wall or something. They'd have to throw them up, but then they'd fly until they hit the the sky top, and then then they'd probably fall straight and break their legs or whatever. <laughs> I'm just I'm just imagining like a pretty a pretty high wall and like maybe they couldn't throw them high enough and it's just like them throwing the goblins at the wall. <laughs> but like yeah, yeah. And it's like desperate desperately get the troll goblin throwing legion to stop. That'd be wonderful. Um, so then the next question uh, is probably a soon TM feature, but uh, is there ever going to be a more dynamic global economy in the game? So that's the caravan arc, right? We call it that, but it's really just like the economy stuff or whatever. And we have a, there. there's a place for that in the roadmap, kind of better than other things that are soon TM. Uh, but it's also at the end of the list <laughs> with the boats in the post-magic, um, post-civilization uh, embark slash laws type thing. So we just kind of want to have better societies up. We want to have the potential of people moving around better, better understood, like nomadic peoples and stuff like that, that you can, you can understand all these different societies and things and then start worrying about economic stuff. Now that, like everything in the game, since everything is just tied together in a big loop, it's like, it doesn't really matter which order you do things in. But um, that's the current thinking is when we do that, then we get to the the question of boats, and um, and whether or not you want to do the economy before you have the boats, uh, and then you do that. Then you do the the economic stuff. Now there's a lot of stuff in there that's dynamic global economy stuff, but it all occurs in world generation. Uh, they produce individual like numeric furniture, and it keeps track of where they're from and what they're made out of, and everything. But it just isn't used for anything outside of world gen. Uh, it's it was just kind of the preparation for doing the economy back whatever year that was. I mean, was was it two thousand seven was Wift Army Arc year, and then like two thousand nine or ten or twelve or something was Wift Caravan Arc year. I really don't remember the kind of archaeology on my own project now. But it's like there was a there was a concerted effort to get this done previously and it got us through world gen as often says just like what happened with the villains right we get all of this stuff in world gen all this interesting villain stuff get a sprinkle of it through and then something happens in this case the steam version that that, that delayed that but something similar happened with the caravan arc although i don't it wasn't as strong an excuse as we've got now but i don't remember i don't even remember what it was um and so now it's still on the, but it's still on the, the, the roadmap in a better position than a lot of other things. And, uh, and then it'll be cool. Like it's, it feels like something that you can make work. Uh, it also feels like something that ties into a lot of really cool stuff. I mean, if, if you're a person that, and we got this again in world gen, we have these kind of merchants that speculate a little bit and try and try and go on little adventures and make money. It's all very, very abstract. But the kind of thing where we were just sort of carving that position out so that the player could take it later, both in fort mode and in adventure mode, kind of be this sort of like merchant adventurer. Um, and then like, you know, it's the 1400s cut off. So you could do things like sea loans and um, fractional ownership of voyages if you want or something like that. But, uh, but you really could just, you know, go out and, and uh, see if you can move your, move your products in places and have bodyguards and be attacked by ogres and things uh, sounds fun so well the f first off i just want to say that now i just really want to play the caravan marching because <laughs> like I, I i had a chat with um the an indie developer who's working on a game called soul ash relatively recently um and he, that game started off as a basically that like you just go from town to town and trade with people and then he was having a hard time balancing the systems so instead of doing that he just turned it into a game where you are a, an elder god going around being a murder hobo um <laughs> which i you know in a way i almost feels kind of a pity so now i just really want that feature um but um, yeah i remember playing vagris is that what it's called there's a there's a game a kind of a little indie game where you have a a caravan. I played it. It was really early access when I played it, and uh, I played it a little bit. Um, so yeah, now there's there's little things here and there. 
You have your little animals that you take care of and stuff. So then the next question <laughs> I have here uh, is, uh, is the relationship system ever going to get any more nuanced than it is now? Any planned joint activities, like more than just one-on-one -on -one group singing and dancing, like uh, tighter family <laughs> relationships, maybe uh, father and son teaching each other skills and such? Yeah, that all sounds cool. It's one of those things where like uh, just totally whiffed it, need to do a little bit better, especially because like, like people wanted people to go out and do things with their friends and stuff, the stuff that kind of makes sense, uh, especially because it also ties into like the, uh, the relationship mechanics that are, I mean, like the romantic relationship mechanics that have, like there was this, I don't know if we're out of it yet. I haven't heard enough feedback um, of the, uh, like people just don't get married anymore or don't form relationships. And then people would have like these, these little rooms where they force them to stay together and stuff like that. Um, uh, Cause we did a lot of rewriting to encourage these things to work again. I don't know how well they're functioning, um, but um, I can yeah. say they are functioning. Um, I'm one version behind on my current fort. They are functioning, but I do sometimes need to lock them in the tavern for two months. <laughs> um, but gen generally yeah. it functions pretty well compared to what it was a couple versions ago. Yeah, I think even the latest version where I did some of those fixed things, like one fixed I didn't work at all. Was it the werewolves? I forgot what it was. One fixed was just totally broken. Uh, or no, it was the undead lieutenants still visiting or something like that. Like that didn't work. But but there was there were some good there was just like a total socialization bug as well that is just fixed. Um, that's nice. <laughs> it's just another thing that stopped them from forming relationships properly or or really slowing it down. Um so it should be even better uh, in the very latest version. Uh, and then, yeah, so maybe we maybe we are finally out of it. That would be nice. So the next one is uh, <laughs> somewhat magic-y related. Um, and they start the question off with, now I know that the magic system is still a long, long, long way away, but have you thought <laughs> about the possibility of celebrations and celebratory magic? For example, uh, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings making fireworks to impress the hobbits. Uh, maybe as a way to give your fortress or world some more historical events that may happen every year. You could have randomly generated holidays, birthdays, and festivals with the use of celebratory magic. <laughs> so we did the festivals, right? Uh, we have, they're kind of half-assed, but they're, uh, they have the whole processions they can do, and they can have like crossbow throwing or whatever ridiculous uh, thing they decide to throw in there. There was one where they were like throwing the violin strings, like the procedural violins, and they would like throw the strings as a <laughs> as a as like a competitive contest or whatever. I guess it's fine. Um, and uh, they would celebrate like like um, attacks and people becoming the ruler of the civilization and commemorate it every year and stuff. Now that doesn't tie into magic at all, but it says we have this kind of idea that we wanted to do that and then we wanted to bring that in of course in fortress mode and here we are again with our dichotomy between uh between world gen and everything else i mean there's a lot of things that happen in the fortress that don't happen in world gen but then there's also the vice versa side of it where you have this kind of rich um economy and uh sort of cultural stuff all the stuff with the shrines growing up around the the towns and the religious schisms and things that happen, uh, the, 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 that kind of stuff all off in world gen. And yeah, hopefully we can see those united and then like, uh, whether, you know, you get, you get magic on top of that, say a, a more natural thing after that. Although in games, it tends to be the priority to make mutant creatures and blow people's faces off. And we have mutant creatures now. So the next one, I, I think this has been addressed in the past, but um, I still think it's maybe worth bringing up because maybe some people haven't heard it. On the world creation screen, there are several presets for different options, like or frequency and savagery. Uh, will there be a similar one for magic when the magic update is implemented? Or will the world gen creation page get a facelift to accommodate the magic update? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, a core feature of the myth generator slash magic update is, I mean, this whole idea that the myth generator is customizable and that you don't even need to have real creation myths if you don't want. You can set the slider. We call it a slider, but it's just going to be a series of options as we get more information. 
as we go, where you're just like, I want a not a low magic, I want a no magic <laughs> universe, and maybe I don't even want dwarves at all. No dwarves at all. Just sad. No dwarves. Just people. People that have like made up myths about dwarves. You know, put them on their furniture. That kind of thing. And uh, then, um, yeah, you can set it down to nothing. And then you set the slider the other way, and the game starts to get sort of all the magic it can hold and more um, to the point of being ridiculous. I mean, I never, I never play. I mean, one of my kind of holes in my, my RPG playing, I, I never played any of the dark sun ones kind of came in between the sort of gold box days of D and D and then the kind of Baldur's Gate type stuff that happened in the late nineties. And then there's this kind of middle period where the people are like, oh, the, the best kind of D&D style games that were coming out then were the Dark Sun game, right? At least the first one. And that setting's interesting because it's like just sort of psionics heavy, right? I don't know much about it, but I know that like basically every character you roll up gets like thought powers and stuff. And that's kind of an example. I don't know. Again, I don't know much about it, but that would be an example of like a high magic setting in Dwarf Fortress where you have to come to terms with stuff that's really going to sort of change the world, how it would work uh, if everybody is kind of set up that way, right? It would change things a lot uh, in ways that's probably very difficult for even the people maintaining the setting to kind of come to terms with just how much it would change everything. Um, and for us, we'd have the same problem. Like if you, I mean, the example I usually go to is like, if everybody has the ability to teleport at will, how does that change society? I think it's a very difficult question. <laughs> I think the more, the more you think about how it would change, the more you think of like knock-ons from that, it just keeps going, right? It just changes everything. Yeah, um, I mean, the more I think about it, the more I think about how long it's going to take. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then you don't need to do all those things. You just need to throw out some, some things like <laughs> make sure. And I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be serious, of course, but it's yeah. like well, not usually, you know, but but <laughs> as serious as I ever am. But the uh, like, for instance, if I said if I did the teleport thing and I just implemented it in the combat AI. Like, here are, like, two or three situations where it's really advantageous to teleport, like teleporting behind your enemy outside their sight cone, teleporting out of the way of an incoming projectile, um, and that kind of thing, right? There's a few things. And then teleporting to flee, um, teleporting to uh, reach your enemy if they're inaccessible, right? There's some simple things. And then you also make it so that if people have the ability to teleport by at will over great distances, that you make sure that the army travel code just lets them arrive at their destination. It's just like a little tweak in the travel code. Uh, just those things would make that teleportability kind of come alive, I think. Like, as a world-changing thing, it would change a lot of things about the game right there. And uh, you would be like, oh, maybe I'll think twice before I set the magic slider on high. <laughs> or maybe I'll think about, you know, what, what that means uh, or, you know, how interesting this place has become. And there, there would be stuff that you'd be like, oh, obviously they should have done this with it or something like that. But that's true even now, right? That's not, it's just never going to be a game that captures all the possibilities because there's too much crap. But um, just that, like just being thoughtful every time we add a spell effect, just be a little bit thoughtful. Here are some places where it, it affects the game. And then, it, you know, it, it's, it'll surprise you. If I, I think if it, if it catches somebody off guard even once it'll really stick with them. Um, and that's, I mean, it, it's kind of similar to the, the way we're thinking about sieges, just like we want to, we want to catch someone off guard a few times and then we'll be happy. Now that the, the last question I have for future stuff here is um, why are boats a pain in the ass? Like boats, a pain, a pain, like the joy what, of boats. What, why are, why, why are they a pain in the ass to implement is the full question. But like, what, what makes boats such a pain <laughs> in the ass? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the only thing I really don't like, I mean, I don't like a few things about boats that, in terms of implementation. Um, one of the things is because we're on a grid, rather than like pushy, like pushy 3D models that can just kind of push push stuff gently out of the way of their kind of aura of hitboxes and collision mechanics, 
It's like when we move a, <laughs> a grid square, then it's sort of all or nothing, right? It's like there's, there, you know, there used to be, you know, two mer people in the sea in front of your boat, but now that sea has teleported behind your boat. And we're probably not going to want to teleport the mer people behind your boat. But what if the the terrain narrows? What if the boat's like running up against the cliff? Well, maybe you squash them at that point. But should they get pushed out to the side? Is there a side? Do you have to do all kinds of flood fills every time that a uh, a uh, boat moves to kind of slosh anything that gets in the way out to proper squares and stuff? That part seems kind of annoying. Um, and then there's the matter of like pathfinding stuff. Like if a person's on a boat and they're thinking they're just in the middle of a combat or something. So there's all kinds of like paths, little paths all over the place. And a lot of them are going on like the shore. And that this boat is kind of scraping along. Then when the boat moves, do we want to try to repair the paths? Do we want to cut the paths and take the FPS hit? Um, so it's similar in that way to how fluids flow and block off passageways and stuff, except now it's a whole ass map that's just kind of moving in another map. It's just sort of the same as the sort of moving fortress sections problem. It's like you have this map moving within another map. How do you maintain pathing information? Uh, it's kind of a tricky, tricky question. Um, and then there's, yeah, those are, those are basically the two problems, uh, related problems, just kind of how things scrape together and move around. Uh, I think other issues with them are easier to handle. I mean, treating it as a contiguous thing is not so bad. I think there's probably a problem with having them leave the screen, especially as you allow your boats to get bigger and bigger. You kind of want to have this feeling of them being able to go off the screen tile by tile. But if you let them go off the screen tile by tile, then the people on the boat are kind of half in, half out, and uh, have this kind of weird relationship with space. <laughs> as they're being de -rezzed piece by piece, that maybe it's best for the boat to just pop out, but then do you have like a whole ass 20 tile long boat just popping in and popping out? Like the popping in boat is kind of a, a more irritating problem than the pushing boat in a sense. Um, so that'd be something to consider. And then there's the additional uh, thing that's annoying about boats, which is the directions that they can travel. Um, and the turning, like a boat that turns from east to north, if you picture a 15-tile boat turning from east to north, then it it causes problems. I mean, I've seen other implementations of it. Like I, if, I, if I recollect some version of Cataclysm had shear, like you'd, you'd shear the some of the tiles upward. That doesn't really work for us um, because it breaks wrestling. It breaks a bunch of issues. I mean, a bunch of issues come up with... with uh, how our how our game works when you shear. So we'd rather not shear, but then we're stuck with the four directions, which is something that I can live with, I think, dealing with four. Maybe it's just because I grew up on Ultima or something where all the boats are are kind of pointing in directions like that. But I'm I'm perfectly happy with uh, popping. But it does lead to a popping effect, like when you're when you're headed east and then you start headed a little bit north and your boat is going like over, over, up, over, over, up, over, over, up, that's fine. And then we, when your boat is going exactly northeast, does it remain kind of pointing east? And just go over, up, over, up, over, up, or just, or rather just diagonal, 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 going up. And then when does it pop? Does it pop north? And you don't want the pop to be just at 45 degrees. You'd rather have the pop be at like 50 and 55 or 60 and 30 and going back and forth so that you don't just go, you don't have like a flimmery pop, right? <laughs> and et cetera. Um, that's, that's why boats are a pain in the ass. I almost want to cut that whole speech out and like put it up separately. <laughs> Why boats are a pain in the ass? <laughs> Quotes. Tarn Adams. Um, the, the 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 next question I have here is is right before the the air. Well, um, we're almost at the end of this kind of future section. We kind of get on to the, kind of the finalizing, I guess, of the questions. But um, uh, DF has a word for tattoo. Uh, will dwarves ever be able to get them? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, something that's written. I mean, it's in so many. It's obliquely referred to by other features, right? There's magic tattoos that we have on a list somewhere, and just you know, yeah, just getting like inks and things, general inking tattoos, and that kind of. Yeah, no, we definitely want to do it. And it's uh, yeah, no, you need to you need to have your little tattoo shop and people going in there, getting their getting their 
getting their tattoos, and then we can describe them. Pointy All stick, kind of die, dwarf, yep. tattoo. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to have a legendary tattoo artist in my fortress. Uh, yeah, we've got all the body parts in places, so the tattoos can have locations. You, you, um, could, you could even have like famous tattoo artists that could come and visit. <laughs> It'll be good. Yeah, no, they're legendary, right? The legendary or like grandmaster tattoo artist, <laughs> uh, expert tattoo, talented tattoo artist. So the next dabbling question. tattoo artist. <laughs> dabbling tattoo artist. You don't. You don't want to get a tattoo from the dabbling tattoo artist. That's. Yeah. they'll just they'll draw a picture of like a diamond or like a yeah. a rock it's like a picture of yes. some silty clay <laughs> um so so the next question i have here is um wh why does uh nearly every night creature possess now you know why you fear the night in descriptions is it subjective or and it happens even if the player has no fear oh no it's just it's just part of it the, so there's a uh, a description string that we had to um populate right with text it can't really be it can be subjective the one time like with experiments now it can say like who did the experiment what year and that kind of thing but it's a static text right it's not a procedural after the i mean it it's, can be procedural when they're generated but after that it's just static text it was really just like this little flavor text that we as you can tell from all the descriptions of the animal people it's like we did not spend a lot of time <laughs> on this part of the game. But with the with the night creatures, we could throw in the little thing at the end. And it's just from the first Conan movie. Now we're on to an area that I have titled as, air quotes, fun questions. Um, mm. So these ones may, may be a little less serious. Um, but the first one comes in, and I think this one's very important. So it's the most important of the fun questions. Is Why don't dwarves need to poop? Yep. Yep. It's just, just, just dust. Just dust. Just a little gravel. It's like a little gr gravel grinder back there. I mean... It, it so so I mean the thing yeah no it's it's like so so there was the whole thing about being the game with the poop and not wanting to be the game with the poop or whatever we've probably I hope maybe transcended that worry <laughs> so I think I think we we were probably at some point going to enter the world maybe before we enter the world of poop we'd enter the world of manure because manure is so useful and. Um, and and just kind of have that in the game, be able to do all sorts of stuff in the game with manure. And then if you're the game with the manure and you put the manure in the catapult or whatever, and that's fine. But like, and then yeah, I mean, I don't know if we. If, I mean, do you really want the dwarves to take that much time off to just you know, be all bussing and all that kind of thing? Get the stains on the side of your walls, like those castles with the what are they called? Garter robes? I don't remember what they're called. Little holes in the side of the castle, people just bussing all over the place. Spraying out there. You need a poop so deck on like, your fort. Yep, yep. So it's like, yeah, it's like that's not the highest priority in the world for us. But the, uh, I mean, because they don't do a lot of other things, you know. Although we do, they like sweat now, right? So they sweat, they sweat, they cry. Um, cry a lot, in fact. Yeah, there's a lot of crying. It's true. It's very people have to learn very different ways to deal with their extreme emotions and so forth. It's not, it's not that interesting a game that we're working toward. It's something, but. Uh, yeah, no, but okay, so but but you can put us pretty much on team manure now. Team like now, I don't know about team team urine and so forth. You can because you, you're supposed to be using like piss for tanning, right? Um, I mean, there's lots of ways to tan. You can tan with brains, brain tanning. Um, but right now, the tanner doesn't use anything at all. But the tanner should be using all kinds of foul ass chemicals because tanners are like one of the notorious stinky jobs. And uh, yeah, so so that's. Uh, it's like, do we want to get deep into that and get into the chemistry of that? And then, you know, once you do that, once you got piss everywhere, then gunpowder's around the corner, right? Got piss and manure, then you can start growing little potassium nitrates and things as you need them. Because they've used camel dung for that. They used big old urine uh, trays and stuff. There's all kinds of weird, weird, weird ways to get the things you need, whereas the brimstone's easy to come by, the charcoal's easy to come by. It's really about the niter or whatever. And it's almost always related to the functions of animals and the bodily functions. <laughs> and then, then you'll finally be able to blow stuff up. This next question is uh, completely unrelated to Dwarf Fortress. Well, maybe completely unrelated. But uh, come in, comes in from Hexwrench and they, they ask, what's your favorite food? My favorite food? Oh, well, 
I like good croissants. Um, I'm not sure if that's my favorite food. It's the first thing that came into my head, so it counts for something. Um, and then I like uh, I like a lot of things. I like spoiled by Indian food. Well, the Indian food's been trouble lately. I think something about the pandemic has lost all of my spiciness. Uh, um, the ability to take it, <laughs> the sensitivity to it. Um, so that's not been so pleasant. But the uh, yeah, I like lots of stuff. I like lots of stuff, I like sushi. Um, but yes, the, the simple croissant from a really good bakery is nice. Very few things can beat a fresh pr- croissant. I couldn't agree more. Um, so the next question is: Do you have a a favorite part of Dwarf Fortress? Or something, in, uh, or a particular part of the game that you are most proud of. It's all such a damn mess. But <laughs> it's like a messy uh, basement. <laughs> yeah, because you like you. It's like you would like the uh, the like water. The water. I like. I like how. I like how the. Uh, it's not a great system. Uh, but I like how the water pressure catches people off guard. That's always really fun. I think yeah, if I'm trying to think of like when I really feel pride. It's like that 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 catching people is always fun. Watching people die on stream because they forgot to uh, account for water pressure. <laughs> yeah, I I I I really like and enjoy water pressure. I like killing things intentionally with water pressure. Actually, I, I killed a goblin with an ocean <laughs> once. That was pretty satisfying <laughs> um yeah i mean the, the thing that kind of blunts that one is just that it's it's so broken how it flood floods out instantly or whatever like it's hard to hard to tamp that down without killing the the frames per second and so forth um like doing 3d fluids is just like i mean people doing some cool 3d fluid stuff now you see it all the time on twitter like these uh gifs of really cool kind of or videos of like really cool fluid stuff these days but yeah, we're just probably never going to have anything like that. But it was cool. Like we we like having our little thing that we had. I'm sure I can think of other stuff, but that we can just leave it there, I guess. <laughs> so um, this one, uh, this next one comes in from everyone's favorite YouTuber, Krug Smash, and he has a rapid fire of a couple small questions, which are: um, Are you taking care of yourself? Have you been staying hydrated? Have you gone out and stretched your legs from time to time? And have you played any good games lately? And what's your favorite dinosaur? All right, so. Uh, I I've just moved to a new neighborhood, so I've been out walking a lot. There's some really nice, and also, you know, we haven't mentioned this yet. Uh, there's um, uh, Zach and Annie have Jojo the mini dachshund now. Who's oh, adorable. And Jojo the dog needs to go on walks, or W A L Ks if you're around the dog, so that they don't know the the walks are coming. And we've been all over the peninsula and walking in the forests and things with the dogs. I've been out a lot lately, actually. Um, enough to, to you know, get a hat and burn my poor little scalp. But the, uh, the uh, yeah, got a, no, the, the, the dog, the little dog is, uh, yeah, Judge is a good dog. Uh, it's been, uh, been uh, yeah, a, a reason to, to get out a lot. Um, and... Let's see. Uh, so I meandered too much, so I've already forgotten all Take, the <laughs> Taking care of yourself, staying hydrated, stretching legs from time yep. to time, yep. played yep. any good l- games lately, and what's your favorite mm. dinosaur? I think it's the all last right. one so, that like, throws off the thought patterns. <laughs> yeah, so the games, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I've, I've played a lot of games. Uh, in my downtime, I, I still play games. Is there a way to order like Steam stuff by um, date? If you go to your profile there and click on games, there is a, uh, if it loads for me, there is a recently played tab. So, yeah, it looks like I spent the the most time on the Dyson Sphere game lately. Uh, so that was fun. That was fun. It's like a really interesting take on the, the kind of Factorio genre. Uh, I had a lot of fun flying around between planets and making a little Dyson Sphere. I made, it, I made a Dyson Sphere. Um, not a whole one because I don't have the time or efficiency or know how to do that, but it was a nice little strip of one. Um, and uh, that's the that's really the one I spent the most the most time on lately. I played Fossil Corner. 
<laughs> playing with shells, shells and trauma bites. Um, <laughs> I don't know what else I've done lately, lately. It's been a while since I played any of these other ones, but you know, there's only so much time to to do things. But that's the kind of thing I've been into lately. Well, especially for playing Dyson Sphere program, those games have a tendency to uh, eat the time away. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, the last one was, what's your favorite dinosaur? Mm. Mm. So I don't have a very, I don't have a very super, like, like I just remember flipping through the dinosaur books as a kid and not like doing an extensive after study of dinosaurs. So I don't have obscure dinosaurs that I like. Uh, I remember like the, I don't know. And, and the funny thing is they take your dinosaurs away because the dinosaurs you like as a kid often get reclassified. Or yeah. proven not to exist and things like that. Like I don't know, do ankylosaurus even exist anymore? Or if we already if we already turned them into something else? I'll have to go look them up. That's what I remember because we used to say it into the speech, the text to speech program. Yeah, ankylosaurus. That's that's the first one I thought of. They've got their little stubby and they have their little their little club tails, and they look like little turtles. Yeah. yeah, that's probably my favorite. Neat little critters. Yeah. So the next, uh, this is one of my final questions, but the next one is, do you plan on doing a uh, summer update video on, for the Steam version this July? So um, uh, I, I, well, I don't know what the, uh, what the policy is with Tanya and things like this. So anyway, the process is already underway. Cool. Um, so yeah, I don't know when it's coming out or anything, but there, it, it, vaguely in the summer. But it's already right. probably yeah probably before long before the summer ends. <laughs> okay, so last day of summer, got it. <laughs> yeah. um, It'll be sooner than that if I don't screw up. But I mean, we're talking about me here. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> now this next one is inevitable, um, and I mm. picked this version of this question purely because I think it was the 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 best wording. Um, but uh, the person says. I, I know that there are probably a thousand people saying this, but uh, do you have an <laughs> estimate of when the Steam release will be releasing? Uh, if not, then how is the development going anyway? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think just for, for various reasons, um, not the least of which is that I've been so horrible at estimating dates my entire life, apparently, that, um, yeah, it's best not to throw out any days or anything. But... Uh, I think when when uh, it was it was it Mr. Underscore Crabman posted a list of the things that were left to do on Reddit and kind of that list was more or less accurate and it's a lot less than what we started with and they threw out a range of dates I believe from anywhere from the end of the year up through quarter 3 of 2022 and you know, that's not not dissimilar to how I feel about it based on my various confidence and pessimism levels. <laughs> like, like, there's only so much left to do, and then you get pandemic evicted, right? It's like, it's like it would take it would take a really kind of strong uh, uh, string of work and good fortune to kind of take it through this year because there's how many days left in this year and you're just like okay i've got that list of things this is how long i think they'll take and i can see it happening and i'm like but there's no way that i have a string of luck like that <laughs> it's just like it doesn't happen but at the same time every day i'm checking shit off the list and then it's not on the list anymore it's a new steam news post right and um then i don't have to do that one again and their list is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter so, yeah, I feel good about it. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, we're almost to the point. I don't remember where Bannerlord was at. I remember people were posting in Bannerlord news updates, being like, what the fuck is the game or whatever. Oh. And um, we've been, we've now promised the, the game for a couple of years now. I don't remember when our store page was created. It was created quite a while ago. Um, but at the same time, I don't see people being too grumpy. I think we have a good news uh, pipeline, right? We have our bi weekly news. And more information on top of that through various channels, including this show. And um, 
so people know where we're at and people can guess pretty much as well as I kind of probably better given that list, um, you know, when it'll come out just kind of based on how, how, how I tend to do things. So, yeah. Well, yeah. from some oh, momentary, uh, incredibly detailed research that I just did by searching on YouTube, um, the trailer was released March 13, 2019. And if I recall yeah, correctly, right. Bannerlord <laughs> was announced in 2012 and mm. went into early access on Steam. Um, hold on, I can actually figure this out. Bannerlord. Uh, when did Bannerlord come out on Steam? Um, now Steam's being slow. But I, I want to say it was something like eight years or something for Bannerlord. Yeah, t uh, March 30th, 2020, Bannerlord released on uh, Steam. So that's like, yeah, you, you got a lot of time before you're at Bannerlord levels of this is never coming out. Yeah, I don't think, so I don't think, uh, I'm, I have no worries about that kind of thing. It's really just a matter of you know, how, yeah, how how many little, little teeny things are there and how much are we going to, get a chance to polish up classic. How much are we going to get a chance to, to polish up uh, like adventure mode? We haven't started yet. Right. Um, I mean, we've started in the sense that we have like all the graphics for it. But, um, it's just those interfaces, <laughs> those pesky interfaces, <laughs> those menus. Yeah. It's like, um, I mean, I guess there are a few little graphical things we'll need, like, like scent trails and tracks and things or whatever, like the little features like that. Oh, geez. But, <laughs> There's this little thing. And yeah, you just keep thinking of stuff like that. I mean, they're already in lists. It's not like I'm having revelations here or anything. I'm just like, I'm remembering my lists. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> Every little fucking thing. But um, yeah, in any case, I mean, it's the, the, the game's progressing well. And uh, yeah, I hope people are happy with what they've seen so far. Well, I mean, at least from my point of view, I it's, it seems like things are coming along slow and steady, which is better than halting and not progressing um <laughs> and uh you know you you keep doing your work and we'll keep playing the current version and probably won't get bored of it anytime soon we haven't before so why would we now yeah no, hopefully i won't have to come on here two more two more many more times before the uh before the release well i'll definitely come past you to come on here again probably before the year's over so We'll see. Yeah, yeah, Maybe that would be time. very. Yeah, no, nah, hopefully, one hopefully one more time. Yeah, hopefully one more time. <laughs> Re regardless, not like though, not um, sixteen more times or whatever we need to get up to eight years. Or yeah, jeez. Well, if we if we chat maybe two to three times a year, then eh, that would be a lot of. Well, maybe maybe sixteen yeah. myths and magic update. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Maybe that'd be nice. That's my new. That's my new way of thinking. Yeah. We'll see if we can do that. But regardless, um, I, I have to. I, I think I've taken enough of your time already. I think this is the longest one we've done. So uh, I'll just, just at this point, say thank you very much for taking an, an hour and forty minutes out of your day to come and chat with me on my stream and answer some questions from lovely folks out yeah, there on yeah. the internet. That was a lot of fun as usual. Yeah, They're giggling all the time, man. Giggling and swearing. Gosh, being grown ups. Having fun. <laughs> but seriously, no. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I think at this point, I'm going to take us off air. And uh, so, chat, say your goodbyes if you got to. And uh, Alrighty, bye. I'll be back in a couple of minutes to take the stream down. Cheers, everybody. And now that we've made it to the end, uh, well, I just have to say once again, thank you very much everybody who watched the video and uh, uh, shout outs to everybody who submitted questions. Thank you very much. There was a lot of you this time. Uh, that being said, I had to sift through. So if your question didn't get asked, I, I apologize. There's either a reason for it or it was just oversubmitted and I asked somebody else a similar question or perhaps uh, it was asked in a previous video. So maybe if it didn't get answered, jump to another one of the videos and take a look. That being said, uh, if you enjoyed this and want to see more of it, I actually have done quite a few interviews with various developers. Uh, Shoutouts to the recent video I did with the developer of Odd Realm. Uh, maybe you, you'd like to check that one out as it's kind of similar to Dwarf Fortress. But all that said, thank you very much for watching this video. Shoutouts to everybody on Patreon who makes these possible. And I uh, hope to see you live at some point on my streams. And if I don't, I hope to see you in the comment section of this video. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.